Howdy, everyone. Welcome back to the Traditional Thomas. My name is Nicholas Cavazos, and today we have a very, very special guest on the show. Bishop Athanasius Schneider kindly agreed back in June of this year to come on the show and to discuss, um, one, the topic of the Latin Mass that he's really well known for, but two, and this is kind of our overarching theme for this episode, um, how to remain a traditional Catholic in an ever-increasing anti-Catholic world. And so I hope this episode is beneficial to you in, in a lot of areas, but I hope that, as it did me, uh, that it edifies your spirit, because Bishop Schneider is, hands down, I would say, um, one of the holiest and kindest and sweetest bishops um, that I've ever that I've ever seen. He's the first bishop I've met since becoming a Catholic, so that this was a real treat. Uh, and he's also the first priest on the show. And so I just want to say, again, thank you so much, Bishop Schneider, for agreeing to come on the show. Bishop Schneider is, for those of you who don't know, Bishop Athanasius Schneider is the auxiliary bishop for Kazakhstan, and he's really well known for his uh, holiness and his zeal in fighting for the traditional faith. He has a book that I recommend you guys go and get. It's this book right here, Christus Vincent, and this is an interview that was done with him uh, that I personally found to be very good. It addresses all kinds of issues along the lines of, uh, you know, his upbringing, his uh, involvement with fighting secularism and um, indifferentism. It also talks about his call to the priesthood, his experience with the Second Vatican Council growing up in the reforms. Uh, it talks about the Latin Mass, the Society of St. Pius X. It gets into more current issues along the lines of the Amoris Laetitia, the Abu Dhabi document. Uh, and I find it to be a very, very pertinent book. And so this interview that you're about to see is definitely a much shorter version of that longer interview. But I recommend everyone go ahead and go to the link in the description below to uh, find this book and go and buy it. It's definitely worth your money. Anyway, so I hope that you guys all enjoy this. And uh, yeah, please keep Bishop Schneider in your prayers. This was definitely an honor, uh, an honor and a once in a lifetime opportunity to take part in. So please keep him in your prayers. All right, Your Eminence, thank you again so much for agreeing to come on the show today. Um, when you are ready, you would do me a great honor and lead us in a prayer. That would be wonderful. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Pater noster, qui es in celis, sanctificetur nomen tuum, adveniat regnum tuum, fiat voluntas tua, sicut in cielo et in terra. Panem nostrum quotidianum da nobis odie, et dimite nobis debita nostra, sicut et nos dimitimus debitoribus nostris, et ne nos inducas in tentationem, sed libera nos a malo. Amen. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, Benedicta tu in mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tu Iesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in hora mortis nostre. Amen. In nomine Patris, et Fili, et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you so much again, Your Eminence, for agreeing to come on. This is truly a good personal pleasure. To go ahead and dive into our first question for today, um, so many people know you as a great defender of the Latin Mass and the traditional doctrine and faith. Um, however, a lot of people don't know your more biographical story, specifically you growing up. And so in this ever-increasing secular world that we're living in, I thought it would be pertinent and wise to uh, dive into your personal backstory because a lot of people don't know that you grew up uh, as a as a child and as a young man behind the Iron Curtain. So if you would go ahead and please tell us about that as well as uh, how did our Lord call you to the priestly grace? First, I would say that our entire life is surrounded and immersed in divine providence. Divine Providence, it is so loving and wise, which God establishes for every one of us. And so from the eternity, Divine Providence already uh, established um, the ways 
or uh, what had foreseen, I mean, uh, the, the ways of our life, the places, and so on. And so I'm very grateful to divine providence that I could be born in a deeply Catholic family. And uh, my ancestors from both sides uh, were deeply Catholic grandparents and, and the others. And so it is for me the greatest gift of God that I could receive the Catholic faith as to say, with the mother's milk. So it, it is a gift of God, really. And so to grow, to grow up in this atmosphere of faith. And then also, I am thanking God that I could live in the time of the persecution of the church. Uh, because in, you have to experience this. If you are a believer, really, then you experience that the faith is true, that this is the truth. And this, is, this makes you happy, really. And this God is with you. And you are ready to sacrifice temporal advantages for the sake of the faith, for the life of, of God. And so this was my experience in my childhood, in, in my school time in, in the Soviet Union. And so also uh, the experience of holy priests, of the atmosphere of catacombs, not literally, but we had to hide also uh, during the Soviet time in order to pray. Or especially when a priest came uh, secretly, they had to, to hide and to, to make all in a hidden way. You know. But I remember these priests, they, irradiate, they irradiated holiness because they were ready to die for Christ, as the apostles did, as the great missionaries of the entire history of the church did. So these priests, and this gives you strength when you had this experience of such priests uh, during these clandestine holy masses, which were all celebrated in my childhood and used in the, still in the Latin and uh, towards God, all these um, uh, devotion and, and reverence. And I think that the, you, you asked me how God called me to the priesthood, the vocation. I think that the deepest roots, the beginning of the, voca the vocation is this soil of the Catholic family. And then I believe also there were priests, at least two priests, in my life who had an influence. So I believe it. The first is a blessed martyr priest, uh, Alexei Zaritsky. Uh, he was a, a clandestine secret priest who were very close to my parents. Uh, and he really uh, sacrificed himself completely uh, to save souls and uh, and actually he was then put in the camp of concentration and tortured and died there as a martyr. So this priest, he was very close to my family. And once my mother saved him from the police and he uh, was, was so thankful to my mother and to my family that he promised always to pray for us children of this family. And he blessed me before he was uh, arrested and put to the Gulag camp of concentration. I was one year old and he blessed me, said my mother. And I was present close to the, to the table where he celebrated the, the mass 
this blessed priest, martyr. I was one year old child. My mother put me close to the table where he was celebrating mass. And then when he had to, to leave, he blessed me and the other siblings, of course, also, but also. And I believe that this blessing is the, has a, a importance in my vocation before God. And then the other priest is, was then in Estonia where we lived, uh, who gave, who prepared me for my first holy confession when I was 10 years old, and who gave me the first holy communion. He was a Capuchin priest from, from Latvia, a holy man. And he impressed me so much as a boy. His face, his, his manner of speaking, of behavior, it was so serious and so solid and, and so peaceful. So it was for me as a boy, it is a man of God. And this impressed me so much. And then when we came to Germany, to West Germany, I started to, to serve mass because in the Soviet Union, it was forbidden for minor aged. And so I started to, to serve the Holy Mass. And after the first Holy Mass in Germany, which I served as an altar boy, I felt in my soul, uh, that I have to become a priest. And before my eyes, it was not a vision. I'm not a mystic. It was not a vision. But before my memory eyes was the face of this priest who gave me the first Holy Communion, who impressed me so much as a child. And then I had, I was interiorly, uh, I was 13 year old, I was convinced that I have to become a priest. And since then, I had never in my life uh, a doubt to become a priest. It was so deep in my, in, in my soul. Uh, this is a gift of God. So this is maybe in some way a long answer to your, to your question about my vocation. But to summarize, it is important the soil a Catholic family, and then the example of good priests. So, thank you so much, Your Excellency. That's that's a very beautiful story. As you came out of the Soviet Union, um, I know in your book you talk a lot about how you started to experience, especially after the 1960s, um, massive waves of indifferentism in certain forms and fashions, whether that came to doctrine or whether that came to really the practical disciplines of the church, things along the nature of communion in the hand instead of on the tongue. Today, we, we live in a, a great similar time of mass indifferentism and um, increasing secularization. On a practical level, uh, this is a very pastoral question, how do Catholics in our day continue to cultivate a sense of reverence and true faith amongst themselves uh, in order to ward off these more negative influences? I think the most important, the first is your convictions. You have to be con have a deep conviction of faith, of the truth, because, because if you are not, have not the con convic conviction of truth, then you easily go with uh, swimming with the current. Uh, but when God, Jesus Christ, and his presence in the Holy Sacrament is really for you, the truth, and that, that you believe really, then you cannot behave yourself in a superficial manner in the church or during Holy Communion. Then you cannot simply stand and take Jesus with your hands. It's impossible. When you deeply believe, here is the majesty of God, the majesty of God in this little host. You cannot simply continue to stand and take, like you take a piece of 
a cake or uh, in a manner of common food. When you are deeply believing that the Holy Mass is the, is the sacramental presence of the Golgotha sacrifice, of the sacrifice of the cross, the real presence of the cross on the altar, then you, you cannot uh, simply be content with, with masses which are celebrated in a style of us of a simple gathering or as a banquet and so on, like today this is, then you are deeply longing for a manner of holy mass where you really experience this is really, be, I am now spiritually, but really on Golgotha, under the cross and Jesus Christ and again makes present his immense sacrifice of love, of redemption. So when you are penetrated with these truths, you have to be penetrated. And then with the truth of the, of the Christian Catholic faith, uh, then uh, you will not swim with the current. Then you cannot be indifferent. Then you have even a longing to defend the faith, because this is the truth. This is the, your greatest treasure here on earth, the Catholic faith, Jesus Christ in the sacrament, all the other, the, the, the commandments of God, because he is holy will. Then you will even have a desire to defend the faith and to spread the truth, to, to share it with others and to become an apostle. You have to be in your soul touched with the truth and say, I am as Saint Paul writes in his letter to Timothy, I know uh, in whom I believe. I know uh, to whom I trusted, more or less in Latin, sio cui credi. And so I think that this is uh, the base foundation, the basic attitude in order to resist the secularism and the indifferentism in our modern society and also inside the church, within the life of the church, it's very much penetrated also. So as Cardinal Ratzinger, I mean, he was, I think, even not yet uh, a cardinal, when he was still a simple priest and a professor of theology, Joseph Ratzinger, he once wrote that uh, the church will go into a, almost prophetically, I think, 50 or 60 years ago, he wrote that uh, the church, many Catholics will become a kind of neo-pagans. So, real, they will live as pagans, but they will call themselves Catholics. Interesting, uh, but I'm believing we are, we can witness such things already within the church in many places where so-called Catholics who, who call themselves Catholics, even Catholic priests and even Catholic bishops, they behave themselves as pagans when they support, for, let us say, the LGBT um, agenda and meetings. This is not Christian, uh, this is pagan, because the pagans did allow all the abominations. They had a, a God for this abom abomination and another God uh, for adultery, another God for homosexuality and so on. This was the idols which they worshipped, their own vices. And so Catholics who today, uh, and bishops who promote such things, for example, they are pagans, really. Or when they promote adultery and say they can go to Holy Communion, they are adulterers. When they promote abortion, even, even implicitly by 
publicly allowing uh, known uh, supporters of abortion to go holy to holy communion. So this is um, an attitude uh, of complete relativism, as of a practical denial of of the truth of of divine truth, and this is ultimately a blasphemy. They are blaspheming God in his holy commandments and in the holy Catholic truth which God revealed and in the holy Eucharist. So I, we are witnessing the phenomenon of neo-paganism in the, not only in the society, which is already evident in the, our society, the neo-paganism, uh, but also within the church. And so we have to cultivate our deep, uh, unshakable convictions, not only intellectual convictions. I mean, we are not uh, uh, cultivating ideology. No, we are cultivating the faith, the truth, divine truth. And for every divine revealed truth and his commandments, we have to be ready to die. To, to, to testify. This is our vocation, with God's help. And he will always, who has the desire to remain faithful to Christ and to defend him, his truth, his commandments, his holy Eucharist, God will always protect you. And he will be your protector. Amen to that. Thank you so much, Rekhati. Yeah, that concept of being ready to die for the faith reminds me of St. Francis de Sales when he writes in his Introduction to the Devout Life, that famous book and treatise, that whenever, you know, those who seek true devotion, perfect charity for our Lord, when they're sitting in Holy Mass and they hear those wonderful words of the creed, how they should possess within themselves a new disposition to want to die for the words that they're hearing for, to die for the faith, in essence. I really appreciate that. I, I guess moving on to my third question, and this kind of touches a little bit on your bi biographical um, portion as well. Growing up, uh, whenever the Second Vatican Council and the subsequent reforms after the council were taking place, uh, I'm sure going through your book, I, I noticed a lot of confusion that was going on. And you know, my generation suffers from those confusions today, especially with um, documents along the lines of Amoris Laetitia and the Abu Dhabi document, um, though those are not, they're not related to uh, directly the, the documents of the Second Vatican Council, but you, some would argue that they are the fruits of certain documents. As Catholics go forward, how should we best uh, interpret those documents um, and try to maintain that sense of Catholicity that you've been speaking of? Well, the truth, we have to know the truth. Therefore, we have to read what the church always taught in the councils, the so-called dogmatic councils. Vatican II was the exceptional council, which is, was distinguished from all other councils, that the Vatican Council wanted uh, by itself to be only a pastoral council. And John Paul the, John XXIII and Paul VI, they repeatedly stated that this Second Vatican Council has no intention to proclaim new doctrines, which will be binding or um, which will be definitive character for all Catholics. But they said, this council has the aim to simply to explain in a deeper, in a new manner, the ever valid Catholic truth. So, if this was a question, when we will say simply, a question of method, so uh, of explaining, of 
in a pastoral manner. And therefore, a pastoral aspect, the method, can never be uh, have the characteristic of something infallible or unchanging, because it is only a method, this is an, a form of explanation. And this was the intention of the Council. And therefore, we have not to make the Vatican to an infallible council, because the council itself did not want to be infallible by, by those formulations which they did by themselves, and new formulations. I mean, 80% or more uh, of the formulations the council, the Vatican II simply quoted previous uh, councils or popes or previous dogmatic formulations, so not their own. But we are now speaking of the new formulations, typical of the Council, like the explanation about the other religions or the so-called uh, religious freedom uh, or the colleg collegiality of the bishops and so on. These are three points, the main points, which uh, where there are still questions to resolve because there are manners of explanation which are not yet definitive and maybe the council left these formulations in an open manner uh, but also unfortunately because then when it is not when it is formulated in not clear or in an ambiguous manner so you you have you go you give the possibility to make um, even erroneous interpretations, or different interpretations. And this is never uh, the, the aim of a council and of the magisterium. Magisterium is by the nature to give precise, most precise and clear possible explanations, not to give to the faithful or to the non-Catholics, um, how to say, an occasion to make uh, erroneous interpretations. And this happened uh, since the council, we are witnessing now for 50, 60 years, these erroneous interpretations and not only interpretations, but implementations in uh, concrete uh, in the life of the church with the wrong ecumenism where the, 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 the only truth the Catholic Church is rel relativized, or even the inter-religious meetings and so on, where the uniqueness of our Lord Jesus Christ uh, is also in some way relativized. And, and this is also uh, those who participate of people in these meetings or who are, who are looking on these meetings, Catholics, other, they have the clear impression, even Catholics, that maybe ultimately all the religions are legitimate ways, parallel ways to go to God. And this is very spread today. And this is, for me, the most dangerous aspect because this is, how do you say, a mortal stroke to the gospel. Then there is no more zeal to proclaim Christ. Uh, because when ultimately uh, everyone will be saved and let all go their own way, uh, the religions uh, to their aim to God. And so this is contrary to the entire gospel and the revelation of God, because God, it is against the will of God that there are different religions. It is a disobedience to God. All the religions who are not accepting Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and continue to go the other ways. They are disobeying God, disobeying God. His concrete command to believe in his incarnate son and in the Holy Trinity. And so we have to stress against this um, again. And then um, I think that we have to know the doctrine very good of the ecumenical councils, of the dogmatic, not of the, because there are clear and unambiguous 
formulations like the Council of Trent, let us say, the First Vatican Council, and then the encyclicals of the popes, specifically in the, I would recommend very much to read the encyclicals of Pope Leo the 13th. They are so clear, even to the questions of different religions, of the uniqueness of the Church, of Christ, even on Freemasonry, and so on. Of, they are very uh, timely questions. You can read these encyclicals, or it's specifically the encyclical of Pope Pius X against the modernism, the errors of modernism, of ecclesiastical modernism. The encyclical Pascendi, it's a, a masterpiece of clarity. And, and the encyclical of uh, Pius XI on the social kingship of Christ that he is, and, um, and other documents. These I would recommend to read and study very much so that you are, you have a basis of your faith. And then when you are reading this, sometimes in some points, ambiguous formulations of some expressions of the council or of the recent documents of Pope Francis Abu Dhabi and uh, Fratelli Tutti and so on, you can see then that these formulations are, firstly, they are pastoral only, they are not infallible, and so they can be improved uh, or even corrected uh, in, in the basis of the more sure and clear previous teaching of the magisterium, as I mentioned, of the, of the other, other of the continuous magisterium of the church is the clarity. So, and ask and pray that, and this will come surely in future, that the magisterium will clarify all the, all the ambiguous points of the council and of the, uh, of Pope Francis, his Amoris Letizia and uh, Fratelli Tutti and Abu Dhabi document and so this will be clarified in the future. It is sure because the church is a church of God. It's not a human. And God is, uh, Christ is the head of the church and he will clarify in due time. In the meantime, we will stick to the clear, unambiguous, formulations and teachings of the councils and, uh, and popes uh, where they, uh, of the, before the council, where, or, or I don't, not exclusively, but, but for example, I will mention also on the Eucharist, you can read Paul VI, his beautiful encyclical, Mysterium Fide, for example, during the council he published, and especially the the precious document of Paul VI from 68, the cradle of the people of God. This is a short profession of faith, beautiful. Or uh, two precious encyclicals, or three I would even name, of John Paul II. It is Veritatis Splendor, on the moral truth, all the aspects of morality, it's, it's clear, and unambiguous. Thanks be to God. Then uh, Evangelium Vitae on the life, so pro-life encyclical, all the issues which touch life, human life. Then on the Eucharist, Ecclesia de Eucharisti, it's a precious and clear encyclical of John Paul II also. And I'm, I forgot also to mention of, of Paul VI, the encyclical Humane Vitae, on the issue of contraception. So you see, we have these precious documents even after the council. And we have to stick also to these documents. Before the council, they are clear. And these, which I named, which are after the council also. And, uh, and then, uh, the, 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 to my opinion, one of the most important documents of Benedict XVI was his motu proprio sumorum pontificum on the 
traditional liturgy of the Holy Mass, which he stated it was never abolished and cannot be abolished because it is the, the, the expression of the faith of the church of, of so many, of so many um, uh, in centuries and even more. And so Benedict XVI said, this is a treasure of the church of, of our forefathers and everyone faithful and priest have the right to this and even they have the right. And this is a very important document. I think that the famous uh, bulb of uh, St. Pius V's Quo Primum with which he canonized uh, the traditional form of the Holy Mass, the liturgy, in some way canonized, uh, because he said that in future, uh, no priest could be forbidden to celebrate this Holy Mass. These are very strong words. And uh, no priest can be forbidden. And therefore, it, Summorum Pontificum, it's a kind of answer of uh, Quo Primum of the Ball of, of Pius V. And so these are uh, for us documents of clarity. And so we will stick to the documents of clarity. And when we find expressions or documents after the Council and currently in this pontificate, which are less clarity, or more ambiguous, or who contradict directly uh, those what, what the popes always uh, spoke, as for example, all the popes substantially recognize the validity of the traditional mass. Even Paul VI uh, granted an indult. Uh, to the England and Wales in 71, the so-called Agatha Christie in Dalton, <laughs> because this famous writer Agatha Christie, she asked the Pope also to, to allow the traditional mass. In any case, and John Paul II was, was more generous then, and Benedict XVI, of course. And therefore, these are phenom phenomenon where we find uh, documents or expressions which are not so clear, clear, clear or uh, which are ambiguous, we have simply to wait. They will not last. There will come a time. There will be have in the future. They will be or corrected or will be substituted by the future magisterium with clarity. And clarity only gives us the sureness, the security, and joy. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. That actually transitions perfectly to my, my final question for you, which is kind of two-sided. Um, one, which is, uh, speaking of Samorum Pontificum, uh, what's on every traditional Catholic's mind right now is the, doc the document Traditione Custodis, published by His Holiness Pope Francis uh, this year, which restricts greatly the use of the Tridentine Missal, um, in, in my personal opinion, not just back to the 1988 indult system of John Paul II, but it restricts it perhaps even a bit more. So my question is, is um, what was your reactions to the to this motu proprio. And then on a second fold, on a practical level, there are many Catholics, uh, including myself, who have studied and, and are now considering having recourse to the Society of St. Pius X. Do you consider that to be a wise and, and a prudential choice? Well, the first question, as I mean, every Catholic priest or bishop who truly loves the traditional liturgy and who uh, grew up or celebrated for a long time this precious liturgy. Uh, it is, of course, a reaction of sadness. 
sadness. So everyone, when someone will, let us say such an image, it is like a treasure which is so beneficent and so healthy. Let us say we have a treasure in a house, in a family house, which is so beneficent for all who are there and is open and it's doing so much good. And then comes the father, family, and locks up this treasure and say, no, now it's only very restricted and with some humiliations, the excess of this. And you may know that after some time, they will be perpetually locked, this treasure. This is uh, actually traditional custodians. This is what it is the aim, the aim. And of course, the, the spontaneous reaction will be sadness, uh, why we are deprived of this treasure of our family, because this is an inheritance which we, which we get. This is, an, this, this is not a property, the private property of the father of the family. It is a treasure which was accumulated by the wisdom, by the prayer, by the holiness and the blood of our ancestors. So it is so precious. And now, uh, and the father of family is only the administrator. He is not the owner, the administrator of this. And this, the family members know. And now he locked this and have no more access or very humiliating access. And so uh, the family members will say, this is a great injustice a great injustice and I will reclaim this, this we have to reclaim to to claim to ask with of course with respect respectfully but insistently please open the, the again the treasure this is not your property please open up this. But then the, uh, the father said, oh, there were some abuses, therefore I locked. But actually, there were, maybe there were, let us say there, there are 20 family members and one did an abuse of this or two of this treasure. But why the father is now punishing the, the 19 others. This is a fundamental injustice. And this is the situation of Felicionis Custodes. So I, I would like to say that we have to ask to reopening this, this insistency, the bishops, and now the bishops they have some power also to allow this or not. We have to ask them. And so this is my first impression of this document. And your second question, then the practical aspects, as I now already st started to say, to ask simply to the bishops, to reopen or to continue to be, um, to be open and pastoral um, wide, wideness to the faithful the priests who uh, legitimately demand this treasure of the church. And to insist, like the, the widow in the gospel, no? she came to the in unjust judge and she asked and she asked and the judge refused. And then ultimately the judge uh, uh, hurt her because she was too insistent, the widow. So we have to be imitate this widow, to be insistent. And 
when there are situations where it's really very drastically prohibitions as in some places already took place of a total prohibition in some dioceses, then I think that priests, they could continue to celebrate the Holy Mass of all ages, maybe in a secret manner, in a clandestine manner, maybe in family houses, to gather some families. I think this is the ultimate extreme only solution, not the ordinary, but I think only if in the time of a war, we have also to have some uh, options of extreme situations. So I would say this is an extreme situation but legitimate because the, the prohibition is an abuse of power. Uh, the Pope and the bishops have not the power to forbid this great and, and millennial old treasure of the church. They are not, this is an abuse. They have not the right to, this, to do this. <clears throat> Maybe on the latter, they have the right but this is an abuse of canonical power, which God did not give them to damage, to prohibit something which is holy, which is so beautiful, produce fruits for so many saints during centuries and even millennia. This is not, uh, they do against God in, this, in these decisions. They are blinded by ideology really blinded, we have to pray that God opens their eyes. Well, this is an extreme situation, a solution. Another question which you made, if there is no other possibility to assist the traditional mass, um, other than a chapel or a church of the Society of Pius X, I would say it is also legitimate in this case to, to assist these masses because the Society of Pius X is not schismatic canonically uh, because Benedict XVI lifted up uh, the, the excommunication of the four bishops and the society itself is not excommunicated, it's only the persons and uh, the priests and the faithful, they are not excommunicated. And because for this you have to make an act, a conscious act of rejecting the Pope and the and the community of bishops, but no faithful, I think, I suppose, I assume in the Society of Pius X or priests do such a schismatic personal act, and therefore canonically they are not schismatic. And because they are praying for the Pope, a schismatic is not praying for the Pope and for the local bishop. This is uh, a sign that they are in communion, but they are not fully canonically recognized and have a canonical mm. uh, status because of the crisis of the church. After the council and with the new mass, it is linked to this. And we have to understand this difficult situation of the church with the new mass, which began with Paul the VI. And, uh, and therefore, in some way, I think that the work of Archbishop Lefebvre 50 years ago was in some kind of providential work, because now we are experiencing the extreme form and the, the, the height, the culmination of the crisis of the church. And I think that the Society of Pius X can do and is doing also uh, its contribution uh, to in this crisis to remedy this crisis. Of course, every community has defects and failures. This is human, and uh, there are also many some maybe as every community have some problematic persons or priests. This is in every community. This is not a sign of of the but. They, my, my 
wish is that they would be more open now to side of Pius X to really to cooperate with the bishops, uh, with the priests of all who love the faith and the liturgy of all times. Now in this critical time, we have to be more united and to strive um, for this goal and to be united and fight together, uh, not against one another, but fight together for the sake of the Catholic faith, of the, the beauty of the Catholic faith, the, the liturgy, the mass, the families, the priestly formation, really the renewal of the church in holiness. That's beautiful. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. Yeah, to conclude, uh, one thing I always like to do for all of my guests is not just to thank you, but also encourage all of the listeners to go ahead and pray a rosary for the guest. And so for you viewers out there, if you would be so kind to pray a rosary for His Excellency Bishop Schneider, it would, it would be, I know he would definitely appreciate it, as would I. Um, to conclude, I just want to say thank you so much again for your for your time and for this opportunity to come on. Just like I was telling you before we 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 started, um, it's been a really interesting time, you know, being a Catholic coming into the church in the era of the Pachamama scandals and all the subsequent, um, I guess, confusion and ambiguity. Um, but it is very good and very inspiring to see holy men like yourself uh, that the Lord will raise up to to truly shepherd the sheep, and so. I just want to say thank you so much for that and for all the work that you do. You're welcome. And I would like to encourage you to continue your good work uh, and your friends, the young people they are the You are really a light. Uh, such young people as you, there are many, thanks be to God, uh, who love the faith and the liturgy of all times. And, and, and and try to be really true Catholics and Christians. And this is my desire that you continue your work and increase and may God bless your work and all who are assisting you. And I will give now a blessing for all of you, for your work and for those who are connected to this, our talk. Dominus Vobiscum. Cum Spiritu Tuo. Et benedictio Dei omnipotentis Patris, et Fili, et Spiritus Sancti descendat super vos, et maniat semper. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. And as always, may our Lord bless you, Our Lady keep you, and St. Joseph watch over you. God bless. <laughs>